Hi, this is John Harcher, and welcome to episode 10.3 of Left Turn at Albuquerque, and part three of our look at the Bugs Bunny 80th anniversary set, plus four. Today, we'll go through the mid-50s with a number of unique shorts, just a few additions, and a number of bona fide classics. I knew I should have made a left turn at Albuquerque. I knew I should have taken that left turn at Albuquerque. I knew I should have taken that left turn at Albuquerque. I should have turned left at Albuquerque. Before we move on, my buddy Jamie C. over on the Hoffman boards reminding me that Chillicoot is a pass up in the Klondike area, so that's where Sam got his name in 14 Carat Rabbit. I was thinking of the Chillicoat in Ohio that was in an episode of Wacky Races. Chillicoot was in Chaplin's The Gold Rush. I'd seen it in film class. Guess I just got too distracted by the roles. Thanks again, Jamie. On we go to our disc three. First up is Lumberjack Rabbit, released on September 25th, 1953, directed by Chuck Jones, written by Michael Maltese. Bugs ends up in the land of Paul Bunyan. Where's Babe? And has a number of confrontations with his giant dog, played against Maurice Noble's masterful layouts. Now, I've seen this one from the time I was small. I just didn't see it as it was originally intended. This is the only Bugs Bunny short and... I think maybe the only Looney Tunes overall that was done in 3D. Now this one has appeared in digital form before on the Bugs Bunny Superstars disc. This time for its blue debut, they tried to get it as close to the original 3D version without making it 3D. They did make sure those green squares that were always on the Channel 5 version right when Bugs got to the giant carrots, they made sure that got cleaned up. Never did figure out what those were odd and who can forget the blue-tailed fly one day he ride around the farm the fly so numerous they did swarm one chance to bite him on the thigh the devil take the blue-tailed fly now jack l and the board were so in on 3d they actually closed the animation department chuck went over to go work for disney on sleeping beauty for a little bit then when the 3D craze died down as quickly as it came up, they reopened and brought everybody back for the most part. They reissued this cartoon in November of 1954 without the 3D, so I guess that's why it's out of place on the disc. I just put it back where it belongs with the original release date. Jerry Beck does the commentary where I got a lot of this information from. Thanks, Jerry. Next up is Robot Rabbit, released on December 12, 1953, directed by Frizz Freeling and written by Warren Foster. Get used to that combination. And you guessed it, we have a digital debut here. Farmer Elmer is having trouble with bugs, so he employs a robot to take care of him. You know it's a Frizz when Bugs and Elmer do a duet right at the beginning of the tune. What small rat pine and for a yellow moon that shine? The gag with Bugs being shaken out of the dirt was recycled from Rabbit Every Monday, you might recognize it. Since it was a network tune, we never got to see the opening and this bizarre version of What's Up Doc until the Cartoon Network days. <laughs> Restoration on this one is just beautiful. We move to a new year with Captain Hairblower, released on January 16th, 1954, again by Freeling and Foster. Uh-huh, another digital debut. Sam is a pirate again, and Bugs takes him on again. Very similar to the earlier Buccaneer Bunny, right down to the exploding powder room scene at the end of the short. This is also from syndication, like Buccaneer Bunny. Hasn't been seen a lot recently, to be honest. Maybe MeTV Tunes can get this one some airplay. It's also another pristine-looking one as far as the restoration goes. Next is No Parking Hair, released on May 1st, 1954, directed by Robert McKimson and written by Sid Marcus, who had a long career working at practically every studio. Do I have to say it? Yep. Digital debut. A construction crew wants to build a highway right over Bugs' hole, but he's not moving. 
very similar to homeless hair, right down to John T. Smith providing the voice of the construction worker. Of course I will. I don't know what could have come over me. Well, if you don't move, we'll blast you out. The main difference is homeless hair is by Chuck and syndicated. No parking hair is McKimson and the network tune. Homeless hair still needs to be made available in HD, but it can be found on Golden Collection Volume 3. Again, this one just looks spectacular. Now, appropriately enough for this week, Yankee Doodle Bugs was released on August 28, 1954. They couldn't have put it out two months earlier. Another by Freely and Foster. Oh, you know. Digital debut. The final golden age appearance of Bugs' nephew Clyde is in this tune where Bugs inserts himself into colonial times to tell the history of the American Revolution. Doesn't always go so well. Like his hair-raising tail, this one was in syndication. Frizz had a thing with very angular-looking human figures during this phase. This is one of the first examples of it. Now, this cartoon has a very grainy look to it due to the style of the backgrounds, but it's a clean kind of grainy looking. Our last for this year is Baby Buggy Bunny from December 18, 1954 by Jones and Maltese. Bugs adopts Finster, who's left on his whole step, not knowing he's actually a tiny bank robber. He then spends the whole time trying to keep him away from the stolen money. This one's sort of the opposite of Chuck's modus operandi of having Bugs battle a big guy. This time it's practically a baby. Now, this is just a blue debut for this one. It was previously on Golden Collection Volume 2 and in syndication. This one is another great looking restoration. But there is one weird cell flaw that's there almost the whole time they're in Bugs' hole. What was that? Constantine Nasser does the commentary and brings up a point that Jerry also brought up in his commentary for Lumberjack Rabbit, and I just mentioned before, about a certain cartoon later on that Chuck would do, but doesn't appear on the original collection. But it's on ours. And it's up next. Our first for 1955 is one of three editions for our theoretical Disc 3. Beanstalk Bunny was released on February 12th of that year, now, it was not on digital in any form at the time this set was released. We finally got it on Collector's Choice Volume 1. It actually would have been the perfect choice for this set. Not exactly sure why they kept it off. I mean, it had Bugs, Daffy, and Elmer together. Come on. Plus, both Jerry and Constantine referred to it in their commentaries. Only thing I could think of is they already did the one Jack and the Beanstalk on the set back on disc 1. But we have both of them now. Next is Hairbrush, released on May 7th, 1955 by Freeling and Foster. And another digital debut. This one is about Elmer Fudd Millionaire, who has a mansion and a yacht. He goes a little crazy and thinks he's a rabbit. Then Bugs trades places with him and becomes convinced, I am Elmer J. Fudd Millionaire. I own a mansion and a yacht. It's a kind of odd one for Frizz, but he always wanted to do something different with Elmer. And this was different. Plus, there's the open question if Elmer is crazy or crazy like a fox. I may be a schooly wabbit, but I'm not going to Alcatraz. This cartoon was from syndication. Uh, as far as the look of it, I think we've gotten to the point where a lot of the cell issues we had in the 30s and 40s are gone, but stuff pops up every now and then. Still looks great. Yep, more Freeling and Foster follows with This is a Life released on July 9th, 1955. A spoof of This Is Your Life has Bugs as the honoree, Elmer and Sam plotting revenge, and Daffy insanely jealous. This is a blue debut, having first appeared on the Daffy Duck Superstars disc. It's also the second compilation tune on this set. The featured tunes here are Hair Grows in Manhattan, Buccaneer Bunny, and Hairdo. Now, this was the first time all four of these main characters appeared in the same cartoon. This was a network tune. Uh, as far as the restoration, you can see the differences between what the 40s ones look like and the 50s clearly on this one. It's not quite as evenly done as his hair-raising tail. We move on to the next year with Robinson Crusoe, released on April 28th, 1956. Yep, Bailing Foster, and we go back to a digital debut here. 
Sam is shipwrecked on an island pestered by the shark Dopey Dick. Bug shows up to give him something to eat other than coconuts. When you have bugs channeling Dora's day. Once I had a secret love. You know it's a frizz. Now, oddly enough, this was in syndication originally. I remember seeing it when I was a kid. But this bit here became a bumper for the ABC Saturday morning show. <laughs> Overall, very clean, but a little soft-looking. Next is Napoleon Bunny Part, released on June 16, 1956. Hey, guess who did this one? Yep, another one from them. Bugs ends up in the court of the little corporal, like the last one when Bugs plays something on a jukebox. <laughs> you know it's a frizz. Channel 5 actually played this one a lot... It, oddly enough, it was usually at, either right at the beginning or at the end of the show for some reason. It was almost never in the middle. This is a blue debut, having originally been on Bugs of Superstars disc. We'll be doing comparisons of how things looked on that DVD compared to their Blu-ray counterparts a little later this summer. We take a break from the Freeling Foster run, but not for long. With Half Fair Hair, released on August 18, 1956, directed by Robert McKimson and written by Ted Pierce. Bugs hops a train to head to Chattanooga, but runs into a couple of very familiar-looking hobos. McKimson tapped Dawes Butler to do Ralph Cramden and Ed Norton. No, 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 stick around. Huh, Ralph? Yeah! You're just in time for dinner! You can almost hear the beginnings of Yogi Bear in his uh, Norton there. Now, this one was on the network, and it's another digital debut. I was hoping the restoration on this one would be a little better. The one on Boomerang looks really rough. It's almost like double-focused, but it is cleaner than that, so it is an improvement. Our next two selections are added ones, uh, both still from 1956. A Star is Bored was released on September 15th, directed and written by, do I have to say it? Bugs needs a stunt double, so Daffy is enlisted so he can do all the hard stuff. Makeup! Another one that I mostly remember from ABC. This was on Golden Collection Volume 5 and The Essential, Daffy Duck. So why am I including it here? Basically for purely stylistic reasons. We all know Chuck Jones has the Hunting Trilogy, which we expanded with a couple of additional tunes as continuing the theme. In that regard, Frizz paired Bugs and Daffy in what we can call the Showbiz Trilogy. It started with This is a Life, continued with this, and ended with one we'll talk about in a few minutes. I just wanted them together on one set for the first time. I'll talk about a definite classic I'm leaving off, George and Jerry left it off too, so I'm in good company, when we get to the final one in this trilogy. The final edition for this disc is To Hair is Human, released on December 15, 1956, directed by Chuck Jones and written by Michael Maltese. Wiley Coyote decides to give up foul again and try rodent once more with the help of a Univac computer and another series of mad contraptions meant to catch the Wiley Bunny. This was the second pairing of the two, not as inspired as their first meeting, with some gags more in line for Mr. Coyote's other pursuit. Guess Chuck and the boys had some leftover ideas, couldn't work them into a Roadrunner cartoon, so they ended up here. This was on Golden Collection Volume 4, and I've kind of already mentioned back when we did Collector's Choice Volume 2 that I think this one deserves a blue upgrade, so I'm handling it here. It is on Mac, so the HD upgrade is available. Time for another year. Piker's Peak was released on May 25th, 1957. Should I just say if a tune isn't directed by Freeling and written by Foster at this point? It's a digital debut for this one. Bugs and Sam battle each other to climb the Schmatterhorn. And the band can't wait to play for the winner. Now this was a network one. The song actually plays over the end credits, but on TV it was just a blank screen there. (laughs) 
Very nice work on the background clouds and the mountains. Looks very realistic. What's Opera Doc was released on July 6, 1957. Needless to say, this one was across the board. Golden Collection Volume 2. Should have been on Volume 1, but I digress. Platinum Volume 1. And The Essential. Obviously, Bugs Bunny. They weren't going to get away with leaving this one off. Next is Bugsy and Mugsy, released on August 31st, 1957. Since I'm not saying, you know, who it is. Bugs crosses path with Rocky and Mugsy in this one, making its digital debut. Now, this is a remake of Stood for a Mouse, which we dealt with back in episode one. And the bulldog's name is Mike. Sylvester says it right in the cartoon. Hey, hey, Mike, look. They do the whole thing with the telephone and then tied up with the saw. Even the uh, gag with the magnet under the floor. I think Bugs and Thugs would have been better on the set, but it's already on Blue and DVD, so they opted for a non-available one. I'll talk more about these kind of choices in a minute. It was on the network, though not shown all that often. It's a little run-down looking, though I think it's actually a stylistic choice. Showbiz Bugs was released on November 2nd, 1957. This one has appeared across the board on both Platinum and Golden Collection Volume 2s and The Essential Bugs Bunny. This is the third part of Frizz's Showbiz trilogy and a key Bugs and Daffy battle as well. This one also got some more use out of that dancing animation that we saw in a couple earlier shorts. Now, if we were just doing things qualitatively, there should be one more 1957 Bugs tune on here featuring these two stars, and that's Alibaba Bunny. It's on the list of the best cartoons ever made, so how do you not include it here? It's already on Blu-ray and Platinum Collection Volume 2, but we've got 10 plus double dips from Blu-ray, so what's one more? Honestly, if I had to do this whole thing from scratch, I'd probably have left one of the post-1958 cartoons we have yet to deal with. I'd left them off. I have to think this one was probably the hardest omission of the previously released tune on the set. However, we'll be dealing with it again as it appears on the Essential Disc. Just not the one you're thinking of. Now, for informational purposes... Alibaba Bunny would have gone before Piker's Peak, released on February 9th, 1957. Hairless Wolf was released on February 1st, 1958. Goes without saying who did it. It's a digital debut. Bugs matches wits with Charlie Wolf. No contest here. Who wants nothing more than to sit around and watch the ball game on TV, but the old battle, I mean wife. June Foray could be so brutal when she needed to be. Working and slaving, and what thanks do I get? She wants rabbit for supper. Seems like it should have been a McKimson, but it's not. This one was on the network. It's also a little spottier, um, though it's probably on purpose, because the forest looks that way. Maybe this was just the style Frizz was going for at this point. Our final selection for the disc is Now Hear This, released on May 31st, 1958. Now, this one is a McKimson, written by Ted Pierce. It's one more digital debut. The Big Bad Wolf and his scary-looking nephew. Yeah, he's, he's like a walking, talking woof-woof. You know, Eddie Munster's little doll. They try to get bugs by going across two different fairy tales. This was another network one. It's also a little on the rough background side. Maybe Bob got the idea from Frizz at this point. So three discs down and one to go. In reality, disc three kicked off with Bugsy and Mugsy. I'll do the real-world breakdown of each disc next episode, along with all the extras, actual and possibly theoretical. I think this disc is so focused on the Freeling Foster shorts because a lot of the Chuck Jones and Robert McKimson ones were taken care of on the previous releases, either through their classic status or through the other characters involved, like you know, Marvin, Tasmanian Devil, you know, etc. And even with all these, we really don't get a lot of the Bugs and Sam shorts here. Um, most of those have appeared in digital before, so I guess they weren't a major focus of this so far. We'll see that thinking even more with what appeared on the final disc. One last thing related to the great American pastime as we head into July 4th. I just watched so much for so little again. Now remember, this is narrated by Frank Graham. 
Well, good morning, John. This is John Emerson Jones, Jr. <laughs> Fine, healthy-looking boy, isn't he? Now listen to the announcer in Baseball Bugs. It's been a one-sided, knockdown, down drag out ball game right from the very first inning. With the visiting team, the Birdie Gas House Gorillas, giving the home team, the Teetotalers, a shellacking they'll never forget. Now come on, this is clearly Frank Graham. Do they not know what Ted Pierce sounds like? All right, big shot. So you think you can beat us all by yourself? <laughs> well, you got yourself a game. Someone's got to give IMDb a thorough once over. And they say Wiki is bad? They actually got this right. See you next episode in time for someone's birthday. Next time we conclude our look at the Bugs Bunny 80th anniversary set, plus four, with the final part of Bugs' golden age career, his return in the 90s, and all the extras. I'm John Hartra. Thanks for watching.